Hello, Imi Neem. Congratulations on The Spill, a debut novel. Um, very exciting. And I wanted to talk to you particularly because I know many people um, out in our region and, and well, everywhere really will be fascinated to find out how you won the Penguin Literary Prize or more, more to the point, um, what it means to you to win the Literary Prize. So I'd like to start, we'll talk about the spill, but I'd like to start a little bit about how you came to enter the Penguin Literary Prize because it wasn't the first one that you entered, was it? Well, no, um, I, I have uh, been writing long form fiction for, for about six years. Prior to that, I was a blogger. There was a long period, 12 years, where I wrote nothing. And then before that, I uh, wrote short stories and, you know, dabbling in writing. Um, so I, I've always identified as a writer, even though I haven't often written. But in the last six years, I've been going hard. Um, and I, uh, The Spill is actually my third manuscript. So I had written two and I'd been trying to get them published and I'd been throwing them at every competition and unpublished manuscript prize that there was out there. And, uh, and not, I got close a couple of times, like so close. And uh, by the time that I'd written Spill, um, the, the Penguin Prize had become um, had become a thing, was, had been opened and it was another opportunity and I wasn't actually able to enter the first year because the, uh, the manuscript that was ready was actually with another publisher which is against the rules. So I, as I was sort of writing the spill, I was thinking I'm aiming for this prize with absolutely no um, expectation of getting anywhere with it. But you know, I've always used these sort of unpublished manuscript awards as a way of setting myself deadlines because I, I work very well um, with, under pressure and when left sort of, you know, free and easy, loosey-goosey, I, you know, I take too much time. So it's a, a way of disciplining myself and having something to aim for. That, that actually answers the, 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 the question that was occurring to me while you spoke um, because the, uh, a lot of people will say, you know, how do I get something finished? And I was wondering whether when you say you were aiming for this prize, did it change the way you were writing the manuscript? I don't think it changed the way I wrote it, but it, uh, it certainly, um, it made, a look, it, it, it gives structure to my writing life. And, in, and then I would like plan, I would get the, the first draft to my beta readers by this date, and then I would need them to get me um, their feedback by this date. And then, you know, hope, hoping to get um, the manuscript into reasonable shape to be able to enter into a prize because you always want it to be in the best shape it can possibly be um because i made a mistake of entering some early drafts in other um prizes and you realize well that's a wasted opportunity you know <laughs> i should have just held on another year but there's always an impatience and i think not just with me but with other writers you 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 kind of this burning desire to somehow get published and and the thing for me in, in all of that in that those six years there was actually a fundamental shift in my approach to writing and it became less about winning or getting published and it actually just became about writing. I made a pact with one of my friends that when I was feeling really close to getting published, I'm like, if we, if we, you know, attain these certain goals within a year, we'll both get matching tattoos. And um, so we made this pact and um, within a couple of weeks, unfortunately, you know, for her, she faced a different kind of life challenge. She was diagnosed with, breast cancer and her focus completely shift to, to just being, you know, about her treatment. And, um, you know, we were talking a lot about that. And she said to me, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to come back to writing. And I was like, hang on, you know, I've been a writer who has identified as a writer who hasn't written, but to be a writer who's no longer identifying as a writer, like I was worried for her, but, you know, trying to support her. But she came back to writing slowly and you know her treatment went really well she's in remission now but she wrote about her treatment and then she wrote more and other things and 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 through her journey um i i realized that actually that's that's not what we should be aiming for at these moments of achievement we should be committing ourselves to the writing and the joy of writing the love of writing the love of words and so we went and got the tattoos anyway it was two years <laughs> after yeah and so the tattoos were not about celebrating an achievement but celebrating oh, celebrating <laughs> a, uh, where is that ah. it's, 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 yes. no, I, yeah I'm, look you may, yeah, anyway it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do well on Zoom. but 
but um, yeah, so it was it was a commit commitment to the writing we had done to the to the writing we're doing now, the writing that we'll always do, and so I went through that, and I also had gotten quite disillusioned with trying to get published. I I you know I love writing, don't like getting published so much. That's quite a a rough journey, and I decided um, to sort of just to pivot before pivoting was you know so hot right now. Um, and I started to do short stories. So I was writing short stories um, for the first time in 25 years. I thought, I'll write a short story. And I started to have some success with that. And I won a few awards and um, got shortlisted and had thought, well, maybe, maybe this is what I should be doing. Maybe I should be doing short stories. Maybe just push the manuscripts aside. And then um, I had just made that decision that 2019 was going to be my year of the short story. It was going to build up a collection and then bang. I get the email saying I've been shortlisted for the Penguin Literary Prize. I mean, I'd practically forgotten that I had entered because my focus had moved, had shifted so much. And then, you know, and then I won it. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. <laughs> You're a great story. You really are a story that I think will resonate with an enormous numbers of people. Tell me, though, that for, because you mentioned you almost got there. I think that was the hidden draw, which you were shortlisted for. Remind me. I was, oh, I wish I was shortlisted. I was on the judges ah. commended list for the Victorian Premier's Unpublished Manuscript Award. Um, and that, that was a really good case of me having submitted too soon. Like they obviously saw the promise in it, but the problem was that, you know, getting on the judges commended list as, as getting on any short list or long list is fantastic leverage for getting the att attention of um, publishers and sort of moving up the slush pile a little bit. They're more likely to to look at your manuscript if it's got some kind of, you know, it's a bit pre-qualified somehow. Um, and that manuscript was not ready for publishers. Um, and so those opportunities that came out of being on the judges commended list sort of fell flat. They just came to nothing because um, I, I did, I did go on the uh, Hachette Queensland Writers right. Centre thing. And that was fantastic weekend like I got so much out of that as someone at the very beginning of that journey to learn what's behind the curtain um, was really uh, invaluable but um, and, and, and and you know there was a lot of interest from Hachette in that manuscript but ultimately it just didn't get up so back to the drawing board. I um, am old enough to remember um, when the first writers classes actually developed through universities um, and the whole discussion about whether you can learn writing um, and then this kind of layer added to it that the prizes which um, are very sensible it seems to me from publishers because they're actually um, allowing themselves to, to, to do the work in-house and snaffling anybody who looks as though they, they can develop it. Did you do a writing course? Um, no, I, I, I have I have got a degree in English and theatre studies with a, uh, I did honours in um, feminist um, uh, performance theory, which has you know served me well in my working career. Um, no, but I, 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 I so it was all about theory and um, so no sort of practical um, creative writing. Um, so mm, except for a, a couple of sort of workshops and. Um, a unit in screenwriting in my sort of early late twenties, early thirties. No, I'm not. I'm not formally trained. Um, it, it's yes, yeah, self-taught. Do you think you would teach writing? Um, oh, look. I think. I think like a lot of um, particularly women. I. I don't. I always think. Oh no, I don't know enough about that. Um, but actually, just recently, I've started mentoring. Um, a, a younger writer who came to me um, was putting in some an, an application for a funding body, and um, and I, I I did the whole oh I don't think I know I don't think I'd be able to help, but I've actually really enjoyed it, uh, not just because I feel like I'm helping him, but also because it's a real chance to reflect on my own practice, and um, and I, I I like that I like that sort of reflection, quiet reflection. There are lots of ways to learn, aren't there? Yeah. Um, the did the uh, manuscript, once you've got this email, <laughs> yes. I, can, I can imagine that moment. I was going to ask you about, about that moment. And it must have been, you're a very calm person by the looks of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the worst was I had to sit on the news for like, uh, yeah. uh, like, like two weeks and I was like, 
the entire time <laughs> busting to just shout about it. But anyway. It's been fun. Um, did much work then go into it? Did it change very much from the time that the, you were, the announcement through to the publication, uh, which is um, imminent? Uh, structurally, no. But, um, and, um, and Meredith um, Kerno, my publisher, my wonderful publisher, um, uh, acknowledged that it, a lot of work had gone into the structure of the work. It's a very complex structure and um, uh, there was a spreadsheet to manage all of that information, I can tell you. Um, and then, um, so structurally, no, but it was more like, I always describe it as, as being a bit like a mixing desk, you know, it's like, you know, move up these levels, down these, it's just that kind of mixing. So there was a lot of work to do, but, um, but not sort of big picture, kind of getting rid of characters or um, getting rid, rid of chapters. So, um, yeah. Yeah, because I often think that your story does certainly move forward and back in time. Um, which is a pretty uh, common um, structure these days, um, but yours obviously required it for, and we won't go into too much about the story. I will ask you um, to explain to people um, the, the story in a minute. Let's start with the, the title because the spill is almost like, oh, I've spilled my drink or, oh, I've spilled my life. <laughs> so both of those things, did you come, who, who, who named it for you, Imbi? I, I named it. It had had another working title in the first draft, um, but by the end of that first draft, I realised, oh no, that title's not what it is, what's, what it's come to be about. So I was looking for something that would kind of capture the, the accident, which is the sort of inciting incident um, of, the, of the book, um, the car accident, but also, yes, spilling wine, because that one of the themes, as I'm sure we'll talk about, is alcoholism, and also the spilling of secrets, and yeah, it just felt, felt like a word that was going to serve a lot of the themes of the book, and um, yeah, the minute I, 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 I came upon it in my mind, I was like, oh, I think that's it, that's it, because I've had trouble naming manuscripts in the past, like real trouble, but when I came upon the spill, and, and then it was like, is it spill or is it this spill? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, no, it's the spill. Yeah, it sounds like a hell of a lot came together for this book for you. <laughs> tell us, um, if, if you got your, 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 you know, your, your 30 seconds to tell somebody what your book is about, which I know people hate that idea, but tell us, uh, I hope by now people are going, oh, what is this about in me? Tell us what the spill is about. Well, the elevator pitch, and I, I've, I've said this elsewhere, like I've never actually used it in an elevator. I'm dying to use it in an elevator. Um, is um, no two people um, experience or remember the same thing in the same way, especially when they're sisters. So the idea is um, I took this incident, this car accident, which was, was actually something lifted directly from my own life. Um, a car accident that I was in when I was 10 with my mother and, and, and sister. Um, and then I, I fictionalised it. I, I, I was really interested in exploring those moments in a person's life upon which your life can kind of turn or pivot. There's that word again. Um, then they can be big moments and they can be small moments. And particularly for that car accident, no one was particularly hurt. The car was wrecked, but um, it had... I felt the impact. I'm still feeling the impact of that car accident to this day. And my mother would probably hate me saying that, but it really fundamentally changed who I am and how I experience the world. And I, I wanted to sort of take that as an initial idea and then look at the pivotal moments in these two sisters' lives, which kind of turned them away from each other or towards each other. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's kind of the idea. I don't know if that says what the book's about, but... It says something about the book. It does. We should tell people that it's more or less contemporary. It yes. takes us back to their, their childhood, as you just mentioned, and it, it brings us forward. Um, it's got a, a, a complex family narrative. Um, hell, spells, what a, what a family. <laughs> <laughs> they are really um, an interesting bunch of people. Um, are there many things that you've had to... Um, appease family members about in me if you had no. to say no no it's not you uh, well of course i i've already told my my mother and my um sisters that you know this is obviously a book about sisters and about mothers but it's not it's not them and they 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 understand that but it's just interesting because the i wouldn't let my mother read it until 
it was a real book. I just said, you, no, mum, you have to wait. Um, uh, although I did offer both my sisters the opportunity to read it before it went to publication, just in case there was anything that I had accidentally mined from our childhood that they didn't feel comfortable about me, you know, putting out there. But um, so I had, because I had started with that car accident from my, my own childhood and, and it then had become such a, a much bigger thing and a much, you know, it's like Samantha and Nicole are just, just not me and my sister. Tina is not my mother and I'd gone into this whole other world. But the first and only thing that my mother, the first kind of preview she had of that was me reading the first chapter um, online for a, a read Tasmania or doing a sort of a, a, a re, a, lockdown reading group and so on youtube she she listened to me do this first chapter and i realized that in isolation and without the rest of the book to go on to read she must think that i had just completely plagiarized or cannibalized my entire life <laughs> I was like, no mum, it's okay it's okay it's very different from them there's nothing no more surprises but um yeah that's that's the only real tricky moment that i've had so you did grow up in perth um, largely, um, both my parents um, were in theatre, so we moved around a lot. So, um, but I was born in Perth. Um, I spent my first three years of school in Perth, my last three years of school in Perth, and my university years in Perth. So, at heart, I feel like I'm always going to be a Perth girl, even though I've largely lived in Melbourne. Um, you know, the last sort of seventeen years. We get to move a bit about around. I had to chuckle because the, the the publishers. Um, um, notice about this book says, um, you know, in remote areas, it's like, you know, two hours out of Perth is, is seen as remote for city people. It's being a Bendigo <laughs> person, I chuckle at that. But we do get to learn a lot about, um, uh, we go to Bustleton, I think, at one stage, or anyway, we, you know, but you, um, you, you're in Perth, you're in the McMansion Territory, you're out in, in, in the other parts of Perth, you're out and about a bit. Perth, Scott, and West Australia is a very strong literary um, history, hasn't it? I mean, you must have felt that you were treading the, some well-earned well paths out there. I know. It? Anything said on the beach, I think, oh, I'm, ah. I'm treading on Winton, Winton territory here. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I just, it's really, except for the actual, the one thing that happens in sort of remote um, Western Australia, which is actually inland, um, after a journey down to um, oh, Esperance, they've been to Esperance to visit their grandparents and they're traveling back to Perth on the, the in, inland road. Um, other than that, I, I kind of stuck to what I knew um, from my own childhood, which was largely around Mount Lawley, North Perth, um, Bass and Dean. Um, so sort of in a, in a north, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, it was so fun to return to, to those places in my mind. And one of my, my dear school friends, um, the house that, uh, that uh, the girls, Nicole and, and Samantha's father, Craig, lives in, is, is her childhood house. I've told her already. That is your childhood house. I don't spend a lot of time describing it, but every single scene in my head is in that house. And I, I loved returning to those sort of, those little touchstones of my of my youth, my misspent youth in Perth. But you do start in a pub and and the drinking <laughs> thing about this book is mm. is um, um, really interesting. I think especially at, at this time when we're getting these stories filtering through about, you know, the, the, um, and you see the jokes on, you know, oh, I drank another bottle of wine, you know, oh, let's have mm. another, it's 10 o'clock, let's drink again. Um, and yes, I, I get the, the humour, but for you, there's a, um, I mean, it's a serious, it's the first book I think I've read in a, about Australia, about growing up in Australia, about the ubiquitous nature of, of drinking. And, yeah. and in your case, you start with Tina, who is, is sloshed from the start. I mean, it really does destroy her. How did you manage, um, you, you know, did that, did that thing grow as you, as you wrote the book? Yeah, like it's, it's interesting because I have had a couple of people ask me about the research that I've done for the book and for me, it always starts with character and story. And then as that character and story goes into areas that I don't know, that's when the research comes or when. So I, through Tina's journey, sort of learnt about sort of, you know, liver, liver damage that comes from sort of, you know, 
alcohol abuse and how someone might hide that or how someone might live with that um, and how someone might die from that. And that's not really a spoiler because we know from the second chapter that Tina has gone. So I don't feel too bad about revealing that. But, you know, um, but then but then through Tina's relationship with alcohol, then sort of, you know, ref people around her and their different relationships with alcohol, because we all have such different yeah, relationships with this thing, this, this, that people are very casual about on a kind of a social sort of a society level. But um, for some people is such a big, big problem. And, um, and that casualness so like belies that it kind of, you know, um, I think we need to be a little more cautious or careful in the way we talk about, about the bottle. Indeed, and, and also about um, the, the truth of relationships with um, uh, there's and again I won't do a spoiler, but there's a, um, there's a moment when one of the sisters asks the other, you know, why can't you? Why have you always had a problem with this? And there's sort of a, a sitting, which is a really good question, I think, to ask um, to ask someone, you know, let's not fight about the problem. Let's work out why there is a problem. Do you have a good relationship with your? Are you able to talk freely with your sister? Well, I, I well, so I've got two sisters. One of whom is like uh, three, three and a half years younger than me, and the other is nineteen years younger than me. She's mm. she's um, the uh, I say the product. That sounds a bit cold, but she's um, my dad's second marriage to um, my lovely stepmother, who is nothing like any of the stepmothers in the book. Um, uh, I should just say that. Um, but yeah, so, so I just think that the, the sister relationship of all the family dynamics is the most complex and fascinating, just so much in there. And not just from my own experience with my sisters and, you know, the misunderstandings and miscommunications, um, the, the little rifts. Um, and, you know, there's times where I'm closer to one sister and then, you know, other times when that sort of shifts. And, um, but, you know, my friends around me and their sisters, I love anybody talking about their sister, just like, you know, there's always so much juice in there because, yeah, that, that just, just fascinates me. So it was such a delight to write about the sister relationship. But it's not, that's not my sis, my relationship with either of my sisters, that dynamic between Nicole and Samantha. But, um, but you know, it was fueled by a thousand different stories that I've been collecting over the years. Say that, but I'm starting to see <laughs> a pattern coming here, Himby, because the mother, the um, the stepmothers in your book, yes. which you say, you know, a lot like that, you're actually really well. Sorry, the narration is really kind to them. That, and again, it's the first time I've ever sort of, well, for a long time, seen a, a story that uh, allows these women. Um, a fair space of their own. Everybody gets a fair, you know, this is a, a compliment because everybody gets a fair space of their own. Everybody gets a kind of two sides to the story. And, and I, I really enjoyed, this is not really a question, um, mm. I really enjoyed um, the, the space that you give those, those women who come to, to marry um, some, you know, the, into the family. And, um, yeah. Did you do a lot of... Um, were they always going to be like that? I guess is the question I'm asking, or maybe they oh, developed. Well, I think I think um, I think yeah. I, I I have been through a divorce, so I'm on I'm I'm on to my second marriage. I can kind of slag Craig off for his three marriages, but I'm you know almost there. Um, but I think having gone through a divorce and the complexity of a divorce situation, um, I. I learned that kind of that two sides to every story. And so, you know, that happened sort of 10, 10 years ago. Um, and since then, whenever I hear someone saying, Oh, such and such, you know, so-and-so did such and such, I'd be like always trying to step around and see the other side of that story and not just take it on face value. So I think it's the spill is a real kind of, um, it's, it's again, a product of, of, of the last 10 years of my life, a real, learning self-learning about other people and not being quick to judge so you know in the way that i don't i try not to judge the people in the book who have alcohol problems um so i didn't want it to be a polemic or didactic do not drink but i just i, I wanted to be you know lots of sort of different textures and different different shades of 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 color um for, for those issues and similar with the relationships um to have to to come so a, a tapestry or a i'm just i'm, I'm going off into I, I i should just finish this sentence <laughs> <laughs> i 
often think that's the same thing. But now I'm, now I'm starting to wonder, and let's, let's wind back to yeah. your start where you talked about short stories. And, and I occasionally um, read this and thought, that'd stand alone. You know, yeah. that'd stand alone. So did any of them start as short stories? No, no, they didn't. But, um, uh, but I did intend that to them to be sort of episodic in a way. And partly the way that I've ended up structuring it. So rather than some very early feedback I had from one of my readers was beta readers was like, why don't you just set it all in the present and just have flashbacks to the past. And that thing about experience and memory being quite different things and how we fictionalize our memories over time was also really interesting to me how, and, and I was basing it largely on a, a friend who's had this sort of fight with her sister where they both remembered something from their past so differently. It was like it was two different childhoods. It was hard to imagine that those two people had experienced the same thing under the same roof. And so I really wanted to have a, a sense of what people experienced at the time as these little kind of capsules of memory and then sort of related back to the kind of the present day narrative and, and, and how that had gotten sort of twisted or bent out of shape into the narratives that they ended up telling themselves um, over the years. Absolutely. I think, I think a lot of us will, will respond to that and, and recall things ourselves that we've fought with, um, with siblings about that. No, 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 no. The fig tree wasn't <laughs> in the front yard. The fig tree was back behind the, you know, that, that kind of tiny detail. So I mean, at this stage now, do you think um, uh, you will evolve another, um, evolve another novel? <laughs> You're starting to infect me. <laughs> <laughs> another do product. <laughs> do you think it'll be um, back to the short stories? Are you still writing the short stories? What, what's happening now? Short stories uh, have been largely put on hold. I, I have kind of written a couple and um, but my, I'm itching to get onto, I've had, got this idea for a, a fourth manuscript that I just really, it's all I can say at this moment, and this is like a big, big reveal, sort of a, uh, exclusive for Bendigo Writers <laughs> Festival, um, is uh, it's something about postcards. Ooh. Um, but um, yeah, so I've been working on this idea. I know, I know, so I've got to think of it. The elevator pitch isn't quite there yet. Um, postcards uh, and surfers, who was that? And, Oh, I, I don't know. Don't ask me because COVID. Okay. Brain. But, okay. um, yeah. but uh, the, the, the other thing I've been, I've been, I was doing up until about a month ago was actually going back to one of my earlier manuscripts and, you know, because having gone through the editorial process and learned so much about my own writing, I'm now trying to take those sort of freshly honed skills and sort of, you know, mm. attacking those earlier manuscripts. And I think, you know, maybe they can be saved. I was going to ask that. Is that the hidden draw? Is that the one? Uh, the that hidden you're going draw. The hidden draw will need quite a bit of work, I think. And um, I'm lucky now through this process to have an agent who is kind of, we've had some discussions about what I might do with it, but it's a bigger job. But the, the second manuscript um, needs, uh, it, it just needs a, a good spring clean. And I, I, I think, I think, you know, I think I know how, how I want to attack that. Did you start with sort of mystery? Is that, is when I think of the hidden draw, was that a, a mystery story or was it a crime or what? Well, I, I always describe myself as being a domestic mystery writer, but, but it's not, it's not, you know, murders and sort of, you know, those kind of large scale intrigues, but more the smaller things like, why doesn't Aunt Joan speak to Aunt Peggy anymore? Or like, you know, who left the milk out? But, <laughs> but you know, I, I am, and I actually looked at the, at the spill as being a whole series of tiny little mysteries that I introduce and develop and then resolve. Um, as well as the, the larger mystery, which is what actually happened in that car accident. Well, as the spill goes out into the world, <laughs> I don't think we should raise our glasses to it. <laughs> well, no, we no. well I've, got, I've got coffee here, but maybe <laughs> that's another kind of problem. But <laughs> excellent, excellent. We will raise our glasses to it. And thanks for, for being with us for, for Bendigo Writers Festival's backstory. And I hope very much that we see you up in Bendigo, um, up in Bendigo, for uh, when the book is out and about and the next one's ready to go too. Thanks so much, Yimby, and good Thank luck. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you so much for having me.